Um, if you've been attending our classes, you've heard about it and you're gonna hear about it more because I know he's gonna keep us updated. If you wanna know more about the depths of Dan Reganol, you can go on our website and read his complete bio under this class. And Dan, if you would please come up now, we're gonna give out our door prize. So get out your tickets. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. So for the people that are here, I've got to tell you, this is one of the most special door prizes we've ever had. Hello, hello everybody online, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great to, great to see the numbers, so many people. So we're gonna talk about Winston Churchill. A lot's been said about his consumption of beverages. And as I studied, this was his favorite beverage. It's called, I don't necessarily know how to pronounce this, Paul Roger Reserve Champagne. Word was he drank a pint of this every day and it made him live long and healthy and uh, a great life. He also had a tendency to smoke uh, cigars. He would, he would smoke eight to 10 cigars a day. So the big giveaway prize tonight is a bottle of champagne and two cigars. So get you, I told my wife, make sure to enter um, uh, and get ready to go. So Betty, I'm gonna let you draw a ticket or I will. And uh, this is in fact, your lucky ticket number 927. Who is the award winner? 927, right there, Burr Robinson. Let's give Burr a round of applause. Now, Burr, I don't expect to see you open. This. I don't want to see you open this during the event. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And there might be a law against that, um, you know, some mandate. But this uh, is for me, and these are for Terry, my that, wife. Those, okay, good. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, we also have a gift for those of you online, because I know we forgot to have a have a drawing for those of you online. If you'd like to enter on online, I've got a. a I think it's a, it's a great gift. I've been kind of close to it. It's the book, The Churchill Factor. It's by Boris Johnson, who is the prime minister of Great Britain now. So if you're online and you'd like an opportunity to win the book, just go down to the Q&A section down at the bottom of the page, put your email address in over the course of the next 10, 15 minutes, and you'll have your chance to win. And I don't know, Jay, if we have a chance uh, during the presentation, maybe you can um, generate a random number for the people that uh, enter. So we might be able to announce a winner at the end of the event. So uh, congratulations, Burr. Um, thanks, let's give Betty a round of applause. Um, just a couple other things I wanted to go over with you. So were any of you at Tuesday night's function down at Century 20? Um, so we might've had the title of the event wrong if you're class and you are a liberty lover uh someone like you burr i mean you've got to watch bob McCune's speech i don't know nita if nita thomas back there would agree with me it may be the best liberty speech i've ever heard um it's about 45 minutes you can watch a replay of it on empoweruohio.org don't miss it it was fantastic bob has been a great supporter of empower you i also wanted to announce something I've told you about a couple of times, and that is the Liberty Scholarship that Empower You uh, announced one of their first classes, and it's a thousand dollar scholarship. And the goal is to keep the flames of Liberty burning, and it's open to any 12th grader through fourth year of college. And there's an application online that any of your kids, grandkids, anybody you know can fill out. They don't have to come to events. All they have to do is answer the question, what does Liberty mean to them? So we will be awarding that hopefully the middle of May. So anybody you know, uh, please send them that way. So Betty mentioned my recent, most recent thing I've been working on, which is critical race theory. And a couple of you, I'm not gonna talk much about it tonight, but um, a couple of you know, I, I, um, I signed up to testify at the state school board meeting, which was Tuesday night, Tuesday, two days ago. Um, I got a message from the president of the state school board that they were not going to allow me te to testify because they had made the decision they didn't want to take any public comment on race. So um, that was really, really something that a state school board that runs all the schools in the entire state had made decisions about what they were willing to hear and what, what they weren't willing to hear. And somebody sent me a link today of the actual meeting, the school board meeting, 
And, and they talked about denying me the right to speak. And the vice president of the school board, her comment was that the school board meetings were her safe space and that she didn't want anybody invading her safe space. These are the people that are running your schools. I want to be honest with you. I've shared information with you about this. And um, it's, it's, it was hard for me to watch. I, I just wanted to break out, break out laughing. Um, and you'll hear more about this in the next few classes to come. So, uh, gosh, so my good friend Nita Thomas, who's here tonight, sent me some information at the last minute about Churchill and his uh, escapades in, in the bathtub and uh, asked me to incorporate them in my minutes on my, my discussion tonight. I, Nita, I don't know if I'm going to get to that, but at the end, I'm going to have you get up here and tell everybody about Churchill in the bathtub, okay? No, at the end, at the end, if we have time. So uh, you can look forward to that. But um, we're going to go ahead and get started because I've got a lot to go through tonight and uh, it's going to be a fun class. So those of you who've been to one of my classes before, buckle up. We're going to move fast. If you have a question, kind of ask if, if, if things are going okay, if I'm getting through the stuff, we'll take it. If not, we may have to wait till the end. But um, the book tonight that um, I really used to talk to you about is the book that we gave, that we're giving away. It's called The Churchill Factor by Boris Johnson. These two books also have been sitting in my house for quite a while. I used a little bit of those for our discussion. And I've wanted to do this class since November of 2018. And I know I've told a couple people from when I did a class um, on the great Charles Krauthammer, I had some essays of, um, of, of Charles that I wrote. And um, the, most, the one that just caught my attention was his discussion about this magazine cover, which just happened to come today, which was cool. It really made my day. Um, in 2000, when Albert Einstein was made person of the 20th century, he was named 20th, person of the 20th century. And uh, what Charles Krauthammer said was, Time Magazine named Albert Einstein the person of the 20th century. Unfortunately, they were wrong. Why? Because only Churchill carries that absolutely required criteria, indispensability. Without Churchill, the world today would be unrecognizable, dark, impoverished, tortured, Dr. Charles Krauthammer. And I thought to myself, I don't know very much about this guy. Uh, is, it, is it really possible that he was the most important person of the 20th century? So what happened was, the reason it took me three years, I bought this book, and I just could never find a, try to find a time, you know how that is, to, I looked at the book and said, oh my goodness, my, my wife would agree with me there, and, and then I bought this other one, and it wasn't much better, and finally I just said, hey, I got to do it, the class is too important. So the thesis tonight, what I'm going to ask you at the end of the class, for all you no sleeping um, online, was Winston Churchill the most important man of the 20th century? That's the, the question we're going to ask at the end of the class. So the resume of Churchill, 1874 to 1965, he was born in 1874, died in 1965, prime minister twice, 1940 to 1945, 1950 to 1955, when he was really getting up in age. The most amazing thing about him, he was in parliament at Great Britain for 64 years. And in 1953, he was actually the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was an incredible writer that really captured Great Britain. And we'll hear a little bit about that tonight. So most people would say he was the greatest statement that Britain ever uh, produced. He was really brave. We'll hear a lot about his escapades tonight. He killed people. He was fired on in four continents. He was one of the very first political leaders ever to go up in an airplane. And he suffered from stammer and depression, uh, but still he was able to overcome that to become one of the best speakers uh, in the world. You'll hear, get a chance to hear a few things about him. He really overcame shortcomings to lead Britain. And why is this class important? So important because as soldiers of the Second World War start to fade away, it's really easy to forget about Churchill, just like I did. I really didn't know much about him. I knew he smoked cigars. I knew that people laughed about his drinking. But without Winston Churchill, Hitler would have almost, almost um, certainly won the Second World War. It's important to remember the ways the prime minister helped the world. And as Boris Johnson says, the Churchill factor in this case makes all the difference. So here's how it started, okay? I'm going to take you to 1940. 
It's the afternoon of May 28th, 1940. Prime Minister Winston Churchill was at his chair in the House of Commons. You've probably seen pictures of the House of Commons. It's got this kind of green background and these leather chairs and people are yelling and stuff like that. So picture it, green leather, brass studs, oak paneling. Churchill's in the chair. Neville Chamberlain has been kicked out of office just 18 days before. Churchill is brought in. And, and Chamberlain had been blamed for underestimating her, Hitler. The war was going terribly uh, for Britain. The Nazis had just pushed Britain out of Norway. So the, right when this was happening, Norway fell to Germany and um, things were not looking good. So the question at the meeting in 1940 was should Britain fight? Should they, should they continue? Could they, could they continue to lose their young men? Was it reasonable for the young British troops to die or should, should Britain maybe, should they maybe take a deal? Um, Cause many in Great Britain, they were just ready to call it quits. Many, many including Chamberlain, they wanted to negotiate with Hitler. The state of Europe in 1940, when I printed this map, it was incredible to me. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that really the only parts of Europe that weren't, um, weren't under Hitler's reign were the United Kingdom, uh, Spain, who was under a dictator, Francisco Franco, Turkey, Ireland, um, and everything else was really, except for the Soviet Union, was really gone. This is May 28th, 1940. The news, the news from France was bad. German forces were lunging towards the Maginot Line, which is right here, entering into France. The French generals, they were terrible. If you could picture, I don't know if you remember Charles de Gaulle, if you could remember how, how, how much fun people made, a, made, a, made out of him. The, the French were terrible soldiers. And the British troops were stuck in Dunkirk, which we'll talk about in a minute. If Hitler would have listened to his generals on that day, May 28th, Hitler would have had Great Britain. But for some reason, nobody knows exactly why. Hitler didn't act on it. He thought maybe he could negotiate. He thought maybe he could work out a deal with Churchill, who was really his biggest pain in the rear end. It looked on May 28th like the bulk of troops fighting would be lost, but one positive thing happened that day. It was really an amazing thing. Um, and that was something called the miracle of Dunkirk. So Dunkirk was a, was a little town right up here. It was nestled between the Netherlands, Belgium, Paris, and of course, here's England. And during the battle, if you can imagine, there were 338,000 troops there. Hitler had them cornered. There was no way for them to get out. It was a seaside location, and the Germans had just taken over this little, this little country here, uh, Luxembourg. And the German forces invaded France. As I said, Neville Chamberlain resigned May 13th, and a new war coalition was formed. There was a British general, John Gort. He recommended the entire 338,000 people be evacuated from Dunkirk. Hitler had stopped his advance, as I told you, hoping that Churchill would join a negotiation. So on May 26, the Dunkirk um, evacuation began under Admiral Ramsey. Dunkirk, the problem with Dunkirk was the beach was so shallow, the boats were so big from Britain, they couldn't get the boats in to get the people. So the most amazing thing happened. 800 to 1,200 small boats were asked, just people who owned boats, whether they were pleasure boats, like I think is in the movie, or whether they were fishing boats, will you go and rescue these men and just go to the beach, get them, and bring them out to our boats that are a mile or two away? By the time the evacuation had ended, 198,000 British and 140,000 troops made it off the beaches of Dunkirk. It was, it was an amazing miracle, just unthought of. How could that ever happen? This is what a picture of it looks like. Look at that. Who could imagine? Who would be brave enough to send those, to call for those boats to go pick up those people? It's crazy. If you get a chance, um, I watched the movie that came out in 2017. It was kind of fun. And to be honest with you, I didn't know much about it. Uh, here's another, another picture of what, it, of what it looked like. So the impact of Dunkirk, that's, that's kind of what the movie uh, looks like if you're looking for something to watch. Um, it, was, it was really the, one of the key moments of the entire war because Germany had hoped a big defeat at Dunkirk would help them get Churchill to negotiate. 
And everybody in Britain was talking about, look what we did. Look what we did. We as a country accomplished this incredible thing. We pulled out over 300,000 men. We can do anything. So it became kind of a spirit, a spirit of Britain. And it really helped Churchill's confidence just as he was walking in the door. And still people talk about that. I hear in Great Britain, they'll talk about it forever. But even though the miracle of Dunkirk had happened, things were terrible. As the map shows, things were just really bad. Um, the war cabinet in Britain was just facing humiliation, Aus Austria, and I'll see if I can get my, my, uh, my countries right. Austria had been engulfed. Czechoslovakia was gone. Poland had been carved up into two countries. Uh, Hitler had taken Norway. Holland had surrendered. Belgium had put up the white flag. Mussolini down here in Italy had uh, signed a pact with Hitler. He was on Hitler's side. Britain was, as you see from the picture, really alone, all by themselves. America, America didn't want to be involved in another war under any circumstances. They didn't, they didn't, they had had 56,000 people die in the First World War, plus 100,000 people had died of the flu. And the prospects of American involvement to save Britain and Europe just weren't good. Roosevelt had just de defeated Wendell Wilkie, which was his third term. So he had four terms, if you remember. He had one more to go. So he had about four more years um, in office before he died. So let's get back to that big meeting um, on May 28, 1940. So Lord Halifax, who you'll hear a lot about, he ran the conservative party that had just put Churchill into power. Halifax was a conservative. The funny thing about Churchill you'll hear about, he was a liberal most of his life. Uh, he, Halifax was an academic star. Churchill didn't even go to a university. He shared the news, um, Halifax did. He said, I've just received a message from the Italian embassy, from Mussolini. The message is clear. And in came Paul Renaud, a French politician and lawyer. He said, he said France is done. We, we're, we're surrendering. Uh, Mussolini said, it's time for you to negotiate, and we mean it. Um, Churchill, at this point in time, being 18 days in, was already showing signs of fatigue. He was 65 years old. He was crazy how he worked, but no one could accomplish more work than him. He worked all hours of the night, often till 3 o'clock in the morning. He had secretaries, and he had multiple secretaries, so when one secretary would get hot, get tired, he'd just bring the next one on. He would constantly dictate memos to them. So at the meeting, uh, Neville Chamberlain was at the meeting, too. Churchill, Churchill told Halifax and Renault to forget it. Churchill told them he was determined not to do it. He said, if we negotiate with Hitler, then everyone in the country is going to let down their guards. Hitler will just come in and mop us up. It'll be all over. Churchill had been prime minister. Can you imagine this? Being in office for just three weeks and having this happen to you, being in this position to watch the whole world crumble on your reign. Um, but Halifax persisted. He encouraged Churchill to hand over and surrender as part of his negotiations, various different assets. Britain had territories all around the world. One of them was Malta. One of them was the Suez Canal, which we've sure, sure heard a lot about. Halifax said, give it to him. Halifax thought this will protect Britain. This will allow us to get out of this. The argument continued and Halifax told him, he said, you don't have the support of your own people. You've got to do this. He said, you've misread um, the, the British people. Hitler's goal was straightforward. Hitler wanted basically one entire European common market. I want to make one big blue blob. And uh, we're going to continue our Nazi ideology. We're going to continue to move out Jews and Poles for our master race. And Hitler knew it. Hitler knew the one person stopping him, the only person, America was just out there on its own, the only person that was stopping Europe from falling was Winston Churchill. Churchill told Halifax that any negotiation with Hitler was a trap. Halifax and Chamberlain continued to persist. 
Churchill said, we're not going to, there's no way we're going to get any good terms. He said, cut. Meeting's over. He said, go do your thing. Uh, we'll get back together in a few hours. And so uh, Chamberlain and Halifax and Renaud left. And at that time, Churchill called his entire cabinet of 25 people in and said, we're going to have a meeting. He brought, the, he brought the three people that were visiting back. And when they came back at 7 p.m. that night, Churchill said it was almost like a Shakespearean climax. This is what he said. I'm convinced that every one of you would rise up and tear me down from my place if I were for one moment to contemplate parlay or surrender. If this Long Island story of ours is to end at last, let it only end when each one of us lies choking in our own blood and on the ground. The cabinet ministers cheered. They said, Churchill, you're our guy. Um, protect the country or die. And by seven o'clock, the debate was over and Churchill had the backing of Britain. It was, it was really an amazing moment. And this was just 18 days after he took over. Um, in 1940, there was no one really that could have done that. Uh, Chamberlain, surely not. Lloyd George was a popular prime minister in Great Britain. He was Hitler, uh, he, sorry, he was Churchill's mentor. He was from 1916 to 1922. He couldn't have done it. Churchill had prevailed over Halifax, who was known as the Fox. Lloyd George was a fourth person that wanted Churchill to negotiate. So what would 1940 have been like without Churchill? Would the entirety of Europe have fallen to Hitler? If the decision to negotiate would have been made, if the British resistance in 1940 had ended, it would have almost been a disaster in Europe. Hitler would have certainly won. Hitler's resources would have opened up. And the scary thing about it all is, let's say Britain negotiates and Britain turns blue. So Germany had been fighting on two fronts. They had been fighting Great Britain here. Just imagine how many people they had to have in Dunkirk with 338,000 um, ally soldiers. But Germany was also deeply engulfed in a war in the Soviet Union. They had lost 750,000 of their own soldiers, Germans had. And so with him out of the way, German, Germany would have all these resources to send, us, send to the Soviet Union. Is it possible if Churchill would have negotiated that the Soviet Union would have fallen? It, it's just hard to even, even, even imagine it. So Churchill... Um, you know, if he would have negotiated, there wouldn't have been a D-Day. There wouldn't have been any Omaha Beach. It's incredible to look back and see how close Britain came to giving up Europe, maybe Russia, maybe the world. So on, Church, on June 4th, Churchill gives one of his most famous speeches called Never Surrender. How many of you have, how many of you have heard that, heard, heard those words, Never Surrender? Well, you think, I'm, I'm not going to play it for you. Sorry, sorry to disappoint you. I am going to play a few speeches, but it's if you listen to his speech, it's really the, it's the worst speech he ever gave. Um, it sounds kind of maybe he, like he was drinking a little bit of that champagne that um, uh, Burr Robinson has over there. And uh, the words were great and it's remembered for the words, but if you hear them, they're not much. So I decided not to play them, but here's what, here's what he says. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Um, great words. And it was really something to see Chir Churchill here in this position because his whole life he had been a liberal, an English liberal. His own party didn't even like him. And the fact that he could be the prime minister at this point was really astonishing. So. Um, so in 1940, when Churchill became prime minister, the Tories, which were the conservatives, they hated him. They, 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 they just didn't have anybody else. They said, Churchill's really the counterpart of Hermann Goring in, that should say, Germany, with full of bloated ego and hot air. They really wanted to replace him with Halifax or Chamberlain, who they just had kicked out. When Churchill entered the House of Commons, he said, I won't last long. 
And the Tories' position was surrendering, surrendering to Churchill and making him prime minister was a disaster. This is his own party talking about him. Um, he'd made mistakes. He wasn't perfect, Churchill had. In 1915, we'll talk about Gallipoli, which was a catastrophe. He had done stupid things. He had, he had, he had, he had called the Mahatma Gandhi in India a half-naked fakir, which enraged India. And, and at this point in time, and this is a number I couldn't believe, but in the British territories, which are all, a lot of little islands all around, there were 87 million Muslims. And when I read, when I read that, I said, that, that's got to be wrong. And I was able to get one. Then the next thing I read said there were 94 million Muslims. So he had to be careful uh, what he said. He got into fights with everybody. He he tampered with the gold standard, which infuriated economists. People viewed him as kind of arrogant, uh, unsound. He fought with the King of England. So let's look a little bit at his life. Uh, born in 1874, his mother was the daughter of a successful American businessman, interesting, uh, who was credited for um, creating the Manhattan cocktail. His father was uh, a distant relative of royalty. And Churchill and his father didn't get along. Uh, Churchill's father said he was young and stupid and not to be trusted. Um, and, uh, but Churchill, he, he really loved his father and wrote about him later, but his father was dying of syphilis and did die. Um, still, Churchill hoped to make his father's political life the template of his own. He began in parliament in 1900. His rebellion was based on his father's disdain for the party, and many looked at Churchill and said he's just like his father. The family, the Churchill family was reckless, willing to take risks. Um, people sensed one thing in Churchill, which I'm going to talk about, about and that's his bravery. It was, it, was, it was incredible. This is a picture of him, a young Churchill at 18. This is a picture of him with his uh, younger brother Jack on the left, his mother Jenny, and um, this is Churchill at 14. This is his father Randolph. So he was a daredevil. He was, um, the year was 1919, World War I had ended, and Churchill was serving as the Secretary of War and Air. He took office in a wooden plane. The plane banked at 45 degrees. And it looked like it was over. Churchill shouted, she's out of control. He had had an obsession with flying. Imagine this, 1912. Uh, somebody help me. What, what year were the rights? What year did they? 1903. So this is, this is nine years later after um, air, air travel, air flights start. One out of, five, one out of every 5,000 flights that went up ended in death. So if you think about that compared to where we're at now, you can imagine how dangerous it was. Um, people had cautioned Churchill, hey, you're a senior government official now. You can't be going up in these little airplanes. But, and they, they begged him to stop. Friends said, hey, you're foolish. This is unfair to your family. His cousin said, you are evil. Uh, his wife, Clementine, was distraught about it. He swore to his wife, I will give up flying. But he was bitten by the flying bug and constantly was flying over France. His plane that day, it did a somersault and he ended up upside down in a harness, his life just splashing in front of his eyes. Boris Johnson says, we're drawn to the conclusion that Churchill actively courted danger like Achilles or some knight for the prestige that goes not just with being in the thick of battle, but being seen as the thick of battle. Um, his, some of his exploits began at the age of 20 in Cuba when the Cubans rebelled against their Spanish masters. Churchill got into the forces. Churchill loved to fight. Almost any time there was a fight, he wanted to be in the fight and be with the men, no matter how old he was. He was a reporter. He was able to get to the war by being a reporter for the Daily Graphic. On his 21st birthday, he was fired on in the jungle. He joined the British infantry two years later and found himself under fire. You've maybe seen a picture of him uh, riding on his horse, but he behaved just like he was kind of a little bit like a crazy guy. 
some of his exploits that people talked about in one, one escapade, he shot 10 rounds in battle. The risk was considerable. Of the 310 men there, 21 of the 310 men were killed. 49 wounded. Churchill said it was the most dangerous two minutes I shall live to see. When Churchill joined the army in 1915, he served in Gallipoli, which was the biggest catastrophe he was ever involved in. He was fired, the rumor was he was fired on a thousand times. He killed a dozen, maybe more. The, the joke was that Churchill had been shot at on four continents. But he was hellishly brave. One story from his cousin and his brother, they trapped Churchill on a bridge. They were just kind of playing around. Churchill didn't want to be a part of it. Churchill went to the middle of the bridge. He saw, he saw a strand from a tree, jumped on it. He went all the way down to the river and he was unconscious for three days and it took him three months to recover. But it talks a little bit about his imagination, his bravado, his courage, his bravery. And, and oh, back to the airplane story. This is him in the harness. Churchill was whacked forward. He was crushed. Oil shot over him. He thought he was going to die. And he vowed he would never pilot himself in the air again. He kind of kept the bow for a little while. Um, but he was a good reporter. He, he, he liked to report facts. And uh, he was so brave that from 1940, he was able to demand so much bravery from others who fought in the war because he'd done it. His persona was to the public, there's nothing that he was going to ask from the British Air Forces that he wouldn't do himself. Plus, he had the gift of language. He was an incredible speaker. This is him when he's at his di dictating, which he would do every day in the middle of the night. He was a super hard worker. He, he would discharge his duties as prime minister and about 10 o'clock, he would uh, begin to write. He dictated everything. And in alcohol, he would walk the floors of Elizabeth Manor and typists would struggle to keep up with him. And uh, it was said that he had actually produced more words than Shakespeare. He won the 19 Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953 from his brilliant oratory. By 1900, he'd written five books. Publishers paid him for his works. People in Britain loved to read his works because he had a huge vocabulary. He communicated. He wrote well. He won the Nobel Prize for, for literature. From 1929 to 1937, his average earnings were 12,833 pounds, which was about 10 times that of a professional, um, a professional writer. But boy, he, he, he could spend money. The bill from the wine merchant was three times the earnings of the average male. Churchill said he wrote to keep the black dog of depression at bay. How, how interesting. By the time he came to Downing Street, he had written and read so much history, he really had a unique vision of the world. He had a vision of what would have happened if he had made a different decision on that day. I don't, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, I do. I, I know exactly. I don't know if that is or not where it's named after. Maybe it is. So he had a couple um, kind of stenographers, secretaries that were famous. This is um, Eddie Marsh, who was one of his favorite people that he dictated things to. And he would get testy in the night with him and say, you know, where were you educated? Not that he had had a great education himself. He didn't go to the university. And uh, so let's go ahead and listen to one of his speeches. This is probably his second. Uh, we're not. Gonna, we're just going to listen to a couple minutes. Um, and Jay, this is going to be mute. This is going to be um, video with sound, so we'll have to get ready for that. But this speech is called "The Masters of Our Fate."
sure I am that this day, now, we are the masters of our fate. That the task which has been set us is not above our strength. That its pangs and toils are not beyond our endurance. As long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, salvation will not be denied us. In the words of the psalmist, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Not all the tidings will be evil. On the contrary, mighty strokes of war have already been dealt against the enemy. The glorious defense of their native soil by the Russian armies and people I love how he talks about um, Mussolini. Uh, he refers to him as the boastful. Hey, Jay, I'm getting some um, speaker from uh, something that's maybe what we're showing online, too. It's kind of hard to coordinate, but um, I love the way he says this. Mussolini's nothing but a lackey and a serf. Um, Mussolini, just to refresh your memory, was the, um, he was really the founder of the fascist movement. He was prime minister of Italy from... 1922 to 1943, and Mussolini was really the inspiration for Hitler. He never really achieved Hitler's notoriety, but he was the leader, and he worked with Hitler on the opposition side after he joined up with him. So early years, Churchill was very liberal. Just some of the things that, that he was involved in that, that, that might sound off to you, but I, I find very interesting. He advocated for the freedom of prostitutes to supply their trade. At one point, he made the case to allow big groups of striking workers to go to the homes of those who are not on strike, and they, he allowed them to bully them into joining the union. He criticized the House of Commons for not representing the common man, and some of his early speeches weren't very good, but he kept on working with them. His big thing when he dictated at night, he would write, and he would write, and he would rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite until it was just perfect. Churchill once said, I do not care so much for the principles I advocate as for the impression that my words produced. People said his vocabulary was incredible, three times the average vocabulary of most people. He spoke to the people. I loved, you'll see it in another clip, how he said he called the Nazis the Nazis. And his whole pitch to the nation was that, hey, we're fighting for a series of English freedoms. And high among the freedoms was, surprisingly, the right to say what you want to say. Uh, without concern or arrest. His rhetorical skills put courage in the hearts of men. His speeches really gained him a reputation. Many people have compared Hitler's speeches to Churchill's. Hitler was a great speaker. He had almost a hypnotic quality. He was very regimented, very regular, but he, Hitler spoke without notes. He was highly influential. One historian quoted it this way, and I think it's a, a very good uh, quote. Hitler made you think you could, Hitler made you think he could do anything. Churchill made you think you could do anything. What a, what a difference. Um, let's listen to another one of his speeches for just a minute or two, where he talks about World War II. Nazis. As the uh, Nazis look out tonight from their blatant, clattering, panoplied Germany, they cannot find one single friendly eye in the whole circumference of the globe. Not one. The great English-speaking republic across the Atlantic Ocean makes no secret of its sympathies or I may add of its self-questionings and uh, the United States translates these sentiments into action of a character which anyone may judge for himself. The whole world 
is against Hitler and Hitlerism. Men of every race and time feel that this monstrous apparition stands between them and the forward move which is their due and for which the age and the times are ripe. It may well be that the final extinction of a baleful domination will pave the way to a broader solidarity of all the men in all the land than we could ever have planned if we had not so marched the man who was short. together the was short. He was through the foot fire. Six inches. Many said, many, had, many said he had short man syndrome. It was similar to Mussolini, who wasn't very tall. Uh, he often berated his staff. He said, why don't, you, uh, why, don't, why don't you read a book? He was rough how he treated others. We're going to hear from his wife on that in just a few minutes. He, he talked about ordinary people, but some people said he, he wasn't really ordinary. He didn't take the bus. He loved being taken care of by the people he dictated to, by his staff. And many said, well, he's fascinated by one man himself. But he had a great impact on people. This is a story from a soldier, Jock McDavid, who told the story. He said, Churchill urged the soldiers to laugh when they could. After a brief period, he'd accelerated the morale of officers. He encouraged them to laugh to an almost unbelievable degree. It was his sheer personality. He wasn't religious, wasn't Christian, didn't believe in the New Testament. Some people said he was Homeric. I had to look that up. I wasn't sure I quite understood exactly what that meant, but kind of from the glory days of, of Greek life. His abiding interest was in glory and prestige for both himself and the British Empire. Everything was about the British Empire. He had a deep sense of what was right and what was wrong to do. He had a soft side. Um, you'll see that a few times. At 17, when his brother was 11, his mother decided to get rid of their nanny, which he loved, Mrs. Everest. And Jack and Winston went and found her work. Once he, they, they tried to talk his mother out, and she just said, no, we're, we're going to let her go. Churchill helped support her for years. He took care of her when her health failed. And when, when she died, Churchill was only 20. Churchill paid for her entire funeral. Could you imagine a 20-year-old uh, having, having that wherewithal and, and that ability to do something like that? He was, he was good and kind. He was truthful. His wife was so important in his life. And just like everything... He met Clementine at the age of 29. Church, the papers, of course, Churchill was this famous writer. Everybody wanted to read his books. He was a confirmed bachelor. There were lots of stories about his escapades. But he warned Clementine. He said, I've had difficulties with girls. He invited her to come to the gardens of Blenheim, which is in northern England. And he was going to propose to her. I don't he think he told her that, but the word got out. And the whole time, the three days before, he hadn't touched her, hadn't come close to her. And the Duke of Marlborough was a friend of his, and he went into Churchill's room, and he said, listen, Churchill, you've got three hours to, to propose to Clementine before she gets on a train and heads back to England. And uh, Clementine reflected later. <laughs> Clementine said, if that beetle reaches this crack in, in, in the floor before Churchill has proposed, Winston will never propose to me. Um, but he did. And a lot of people thought Churchill was a sexist. He, he fought voting rights for women for a while. But a lot of people said he liked really clever, uh, intelligent women. People said Churchill was a, you know, a warmonger. He had dated showgirls, married women, a somebody from the royal family. But Clementine proved to be the love of his life. And um, even though she was liberal, of course, Churchill was I, really up till the 1920s, late 1920s, but she gave him nothing but loyalty and support. There, there was a report that Clementine whacked a suffragette who tried to push Churchill under a train, but she softened him up at one point when the world was starting to break. This is such, such an interesting note. This is Churchill and Clementine in their first year of marriage. But this is what Clementine, she wrote a note to Churchill. She was concerned about his brash style. 
And this is what she wrote. Dear Winston, I hope you will forgive me if I tell you something that I feel you ought to know. One of the men in our, your entourage has come in and told me there's a danger of you being genuinely disliked by your colleagues and your subordinates because of your rough behavior. My darling Winston, I must confess to you that I've noticed a deterioration in your manner and you are not so kind as you used to be. It is for you to give orders. Therefore, with this terrific power you have, you must combine urbanity, kindness, and if possible, Olympic calm. You will not get your best results by rudeness that will breed dislike or slave mentality. Please forgive your loving, devoted, and watchful Clemmy. What a note. The impression exists that Clementine was a woman totally bound up in her husband's life and career. Well, she was at a luncheon in 1953 with this Lord Halifax who you keep hearing about, and she retorted to him, if the country had depended on you, we probably would have lost the war. She gave up almost everything for Winston. This is sad. At one point in her later years, she reflected that she reflected to her daughter, Mary, which was one of their four children, that she had really missed the job of bringing up her kids. She spent all her time taking care of Winston. She didn't have time to take care of her own kids. This is where they lived, kind of. He would, he would get in a car during the middle of the night, and they would, he would travel from Chartwell, which is, which is kind of his country house, into England, and that's where he would stay up and write at all hours of the night. And um, it doesn't look like quite, it looks like a pretty good place, right? Um, so I put this in for my wife because I knew she was going to be here tonight. Can we give her a round of applause? My wife, Becky, back there. Um, so this is um, what Winston Churchill said about Clementine. My most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. And um, that's so true. Um, tough times, though. We're ahead. It's 1940, the Germans are in the process of trying to destroy the Royal Air Force. They could have. Churchill, he, he, was, he was the leader of the country. He steps up with a machine gun and he takes the weapons out of a soldier's hand and holds the gun, he faces the camera. And this image was used everywhere around the world. The Germans tried to use it as prop against, propaganda against him. This is with a Tommy gun, three months before D-Day. Um, Churchill was kind of the John Bull of his time. He, no other politician could have pulled the, the gun thing off. He identified with his people. He loved the English men who fought for him. This is, okay, this is kind of a off-color story, but I think it's kind of an interesting one. So it's a, it's, it's a tough story, but this casts light on Churchill. He reached out to a condom manufacturer who had made I don't know if I've ever used that word in empower, well, but he reached out to a condom manufacturer who had made muzzles for the English rifles. He said, I want you to make every carton of condoms 10 and a half inches long. I want every box, every carton, every pack to say British size medium. That will show the Nazis who is the master race. He was a tough guy. He drank whiskey. His, his daughter kind of tried to say, well, it was mixed with water but uh, who knows? His trademark, he would leave about a third of a cigar in his ashtray. And Churchill loved to say, never forget your trademark. He would smoke eight to 10 cigars a day. He would, he would drink a pint of Paul, Paul Roger. Bro, you're gonna have to tell me how that's pronounced later on, okay? Paul Roger champagne. Get this together, white wine at lunch, red wine at dinner, and a port or a brandy afterwards. Uh, sounds like an okay, okay day. Uh, he would speak tough. Another, uh, you guys are gonna have to forgive me, but I think it's a fun story. At one time, this guy Halifax, who was just a pain in his butt constantly, came to see Churchill. Churchill told his aide, tell the Lord Halifax that I'm sealed in the privy and can only deal with one shit at a time. A great story. Uh, Churchill wasn't religious. I'm ready to meet my maker. Now, whether my maker is ready for the great ordeal of meeting me is in question. Um, 
he was cool. Hats, he loved hats of every kind. Top hats, yachting caps, firemen's hats, builders' hats, fedoras, sombreros. He had this cape deal that I don't think was that good of a look for him. But there was a sense of eccentricity and humor that helped to express Britain what he was fighting for. The clear difference between Churchill's life and Hitler's life was Hitler was ghastly serious. He, 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 he had his uniform. He was a teetotaler. He was miserable. This contrasted to the Churchill factor, something that allowed Churchill to stand for the country. These were things he fought for in, in the early 1900s before he joined the Conservative Party. Uh, things that sound will sound similar to you because you're hearing about it right now, but um, he believed in a living wage. He helped set up job centers for the unemployed. He increased taxes on the rich to pay for social programs. He was a free trader. He started unemployment insurance in Great Britain. He shortened prison sentences, reduced solitary confinement. He showed no, he showed, he showed, he showed a total indifference to people's sexual preferences. He tried to limit sentences. He often found himself with siding himself with unions. He reduced the pension age to 65. He firmly believed in the protection of the British people. He championed social reform because it was in his interest. From the beginning of his career, we could find him. He was the Bill Clinton of his time. He triangulated. He tried to get on every side of an issue. He was genuinely compassionate. People would ask him, what were his genuine motives as, as he started to steer the country into 1940? He had a simple motto. I'm conservative in principle and liberal in sympathy. And he, I think that's what he did. Even in his later years, you'll hear that. Here he is accepting a cigar from a factory worker in 1942. He was a compassionate leader. This is a really a great story. You've got at the, at the end of World War I, Churchill was in charge of munitions for Great Britain. So this is like 1917. On a November 11th, Germany signed the armistice and it, it was, Germany was in total chaos. They had run out of food, totally run out of food. Churchill found himself with Prime Minister Lloyd George, who was his mentor. George had taught him, had taught him everything. He fought with Lloyd George. He said, you've got to send these German people food. They're totally out of food. These people are starving to death. Lloyd George says, I don't want to send food. I want to shoot Wilhelm II, the General Kaiser, the emperor. And Churchill said, a nation should show in war resolution in defeat, defiance in victory, magnanimity in peace, and goodwill. A few facts about the wars. World War I, 37 million people dead. That's a staggering number. One million in Britain flew ravaging many of those 37 million. World War II, 60 million dead, one million British. Churchill was integral to the management of both wars. Some people said he was a warmonger. Um, seldom has there been a statesman as good at glorifying war as Churchill. Another person said about Churchill, Winston has got his war paint on and is ready for the fight. It seemed that way. But Churchill, one of the worst things about him was that he was keen on using mustard gas. His generals had to restrain him from using mustard gas in World War II. He ordered the destruction of the French fleet in 1940. He sent thousands to die in Gallipoli. He served as Secretary of State. He was later blamed in 1930s for the lack of readiness in World War II. He was a technocrat. He loved to create things. He loved to vision things. He was a big fan of H.G. Wells. This caused some interesting ideas. He became fascinated totally with the idea of creating a new vehicle and so in 1916, this is like one year before, do I have my year right? World War I ended in 1917, 1918. Um, but Churchill had this idea, I'm going to build a vehicle that's going to win us the war. He, 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 he formed the Land Ships Committee. A couple of people got together. They wanted to create a vehicle that would take, that would cross a nine foot gap. So about half this room from here to there, a vehicle that would hop right over that. It would hold six guns. It could fire broadside, go through wire entanglements. And this is what it looked like. It was called the water tank. 
400 of them went into action in 1917. Churchill continually tried to equip his forces with the best devices. He believed technology was essential for Britain to win. He drove technology. He risked his life on the front. He knew the soldiers. He was the biggest policy wonk ever in his work rate. It was hard to imagine how hard the guy could live and work and how much he could get done. Boris Johnson said Churchill was no scientist, but he had a marvelous ability to visualize, visualize articulate, and to fire the imagination of the people. And this is interesting. I never knew this, that that water tank he created, many people thought that it shortened the entire war and arguably helped win the First World War. You don't really think of Churchill as being instrumental um, as much in World War I, or at least I don't. So Clementine in uh, Churchill's day was rumored not to spend a lot of time around his bedroom because he would just kind of go into his dictating screen, streams and he would have his kind of booze filled lunch. The typewriter would be loaded in the car. He would leave Chartwell, head to London. At the time he would be producing large quantities of texts and thousands of words. By now, most people would be tired out. They would, um, they would just say, boy, it's time to go to bed. But he would go throughout the night with his mix of chemicals at 3 a.m. He would go to bed. He produced five budgets for the government. He published 31 books. His speeches run 8,700 pages. He produced innumerable entries into parliament in speeches and inventions. He, had, he was able to hold so much data in his head. Everybody in the government in Britain asked him, will you negotiate this? Will you negotiate that? He wasn't smart mathematically, but his energy, his RPM, um, what sometimes we call bandwidth, his bandwidth was incredible, how many different projects he could take on, how he could juggle them, how he could get things done. Uh, but leading up to 1940, he had really chosen the nation's fate and it allowed him to grasp all these details in his mind. He knew in reality, and, and really he, he was one of the few, what would, what would happen if Hitler was able to rule Britain. And this intuition, I want you to remember this because his intuition, he was one of the few that understood it. This intuition of Churchill, where he knew what was gonna happen with Hitler, it's gonna come back and we're gonna talk about it, another, another, another great example of it. So kind of hold, hold on to that. Churchill said, I hate to go to bed at night feeling like I've done nothing useful in the day. It's the same feeling as if you had gone to bed at night without brushing your teeth. The Nazis, Hitler and Churchill, they never met. They came close in 1938, they were at a Munich hotel. Churchill made the overture to Hitler, but Hitler stiffed him, didn't show up. From the beginning, Churchill made the right decision about Hitler. He, he, he put his horse on, I'm not going with Hitler. And I think this makes a good point that politicians, a lot of them have to be gamblers. You know, which side am I gonna go on? Am I gonna go on this side or this side? But he, he picked the right side. He loved risky stuff. He loved flying a plane, being a, around the war, gambling for money, going to the casino. It didn't all go well for Churchill. I'm painting a pretty um, rosy picture of him so far, but everything didn't go perfectly at all. Uh, in 1914, Churchill took it on himself to personally mastermind the defense of Antwerp, Belgium. Antwerp is up here in Belgium, which is right over here. Um, the Morning Post said it was a costly blunder for Churchill who pranced around in his cape and yachting cap. The goal for Antwerp was to hold for 10 days. They made it six days. It was a bad loss, but it wasn't anything remotely like Gallipoli. Gallipoli is right here. And uh, in, in 1914, Churchill wanted to attack the Germans ally Turkey with the goal being to be able to attack Germany from two sides. Hitler had spent time in Gallipoli. Actually the goal, I had that a little wrong, was to seize the peninsula to allow a strategic um, sea route to Russia. There was not a backdoor to Germany, no easy route to victory, too much area. Britain. Churchill was in charge of munitions. He didn't have enough ammunition there to pull it off. The operation was a complete failure. 180,000 people died. It was a catastrophe. 
it was hard for him to recover. He was immediately fired by the prime minister, um, Asquith, for what had happened in Gallipoli. Churchill took the blame. He said, I'm finished. Clementine said, I thought he would die in grief. The disaster started to convince people that Churchill, his judgment wasn't good. He fought with John Maynard Keynes about the gold standard. He fought with Gandhi in India. In, he had this fight with the king, who, King Edward VIII, who was having an affair with an American divorcee. He tried to back the king up, and the House of Commons laughed him down. He was at the low point of his entire life, and in three and a half years, he would become prime minister. He bounced back with all the losses. He didn't internalize his defeats except Gallipoli. He never got over that, never got over it. He was never accused of corruption, cheating, lying. And at the same time, he was founding the welfare state. He would continue to act on his insights. He constantly called attention to parliament, what was happening with the Jews. He warned of Nazi ideology when Hitler gained power in 1933. Churchill loved France. He loved the wine, the food, the Cote d'Azur. He believed in the greatness of France. But he found himself with the French prime minister and also Paul Renaud, who asked Churchill whether Britain would release France from her obligations and allow her to surrender to Hitler. On June 14, 1940, France surrendered. Britain became alarmed. What, would, what to do next in May or June of 1940? Many in Britain wanted to appease. Churchill begged Americans for destroyers and told them there's nothing to stop Hitler from taking the entire Brit British Navy. See, the French, hello, the French had the best fleet of ships in the world. And what was going to happen was Germany, when they were taking France over, was going to come into France and take all those ships. And then what they were going to do is they were going to take the ships and go to Britain and try to destroy them. And, and Churchill just became just, just paranoid about this. He formed Operation Catapult, which was uh, operation to neutralize the French fleet and get the French fleet back before Hitler could take it. He was successful. It, it took a full scale battle between the British and the French who were his friends. But at the end, Churchill had the, had the boats from France. Um, this is what it looked like. This is what the war looked like to get the boats. Churchill thought the threat to Britain was imminent. He thought for the first time in 900 years that Hitler was going to attack Britain. He was worried about it. He drew up Operation Sea Lion, which was a, a protection plan to put 1918 barges off the coast right here to stop Germany from invading them. But his leadership was kind of magical. He was able to increase manufacturing. He tried with France. He wasn't successful. France surrendered. And um, Churchill had the, told the House of Commons, leave your judgments of my actions to the nation and to the United States, who he surely needed. When asked, how are you going to win the war in 1941, Churchill had a simple answer. I shall drag the United States in. That's one that's been a pretty frequent used option. How was, how was Churchill going to get the Americans on board? They didn't want to have anything to do with this at all. The war wasn't going well. They were out, kicked out of Norway, uh, surrendered Crete. Hitler had broken his word, and Hitler had broken his word and attacked Russia right there. As Churchill prepared to meet with Roosevelt, his mission was, I've got to, I've got to get America involved or we're going to lose the war. They met at the Atlantic Charter. This is Churchill and Roosevelt. Roosevelt didn't give an inch. We don't wanna be involved in this war. Um, what happened was uh, really amazing how Churchill lobbied to get America involved. Lord Halifax, his, his, his nuisance on his, on, his, on his backside, he was the British envoy. He was sent to America. You've gotta go talk to Roosevelt. You've gotta make this happen or the war is gonna be over. Halifax sat down, he wept, he wept and cried. The Americans had no interest in being in the war. Churchill set out again. He, um, he started to make progress. They had a war debt with America, which they paid. They, um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, of course, is what changed Roosevelt's position. 
Churchill had become so important, so well known in America, he was one of the most popular performers on American radio. This is amazing. Churchill tried so hard to get FDR involved, he actually went to America and spent three weeks at FDR. Could you imagine this man staying up till three o'clock in the morning, staying with you for three weeks? Uh, and you've got FDR who's sick um, at that time having to put up with it. Um, the Americans were in. Britain wasn't doing well. Churchill was in control. Singapore fell in 1942. Churchill told his men, you are to fight until the last man dies. They didn't listen to him. The British equipment was old. They needed help. Churchill left Britain to go to Moscow to see Stalin. Stalin told him, your troops are no good. They're not fighting. They're not working hard. You can't win a war without better fighting. It shocked Churchill to hear this. But by 1944, Britain was Britain was contributing a very small part of the Allied effort. As I said earlier, the, the Americans were supplying the money and the Russians were killing 750,000 Germans and it was about the same the other way around. There were about 700,000 Soviets that had died. Churchill was constantly traveling to America and everywhere to try to coordinate this all. He traveled 111,000 miles. Could you imagine anybody traveling that much back then? How could you even do it? It took him 792 hours in the sea, 339 hours in the air. He finally arrived at Normandy on D-Day plus six. You've heard the story, I'm sure I'll have to move about D-Day. Churchill decided he was gonna go to D-Day. He was gonna be there that day. He was just like everything else he did. I've gotta be there or this will be another Gallipoli. The king found out that Churchill was gonna go. The king, the king went to him and the king said, Churchill's 65 years old. He said, you can't go to D-Day. Churchill said, I'm going to D-Day. The king said, if you're gonna to go to D-Day, then I'm going with you. And it took a, an intervention of the entire British government to stop both of them from going. But Churchill still made it there six days later. Churchill was so nervous about D-Day after Gallipoli. This is him crossing the Rhine in 1945. This is an interesting conversation that points to the character when Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt met. This is so interesting to me. This is what Stalin said. Poland must be bisected in two with one half of the country to Russia. 50,000 Germans must be killed. Their general staff must go. That's amazing to think that Stalin would say, you're gonna kill 50,000 of them. Churchill says, I will not be party to any butcher in cold blood. What happens in hot blood is another matter. Roosevelt says, you don't think of Roosevelt this way. Roosevelt says, I have a, a compromise to propose. Not 50,000, but how about we shoot 49,000? It's amazing to me. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing to me to hear that. Um, timeline, April 30th, 1945, Hitler commits suicide in a German bunker. May 7th, 1945, Germany surrenders. Someone said, the English lose every battle but the last. That is, and Churchill said, hey, that's exactly what I hoped. So um, surprisingly, Churchill had never persuaded Roosevelt to visit Britain. And Churchill's war with the German people uh, was the Nazis who he hated. Russia had suffered mightily. They had actually lost 20 million people. Stalin still had 6.4 million people in Europe, 24,000 in Potsdam. Stalin was ruthless. Truman, um, Roosevelt dies. Truman becomes president of the United States. And Churchill asked Truman the question after Germany's defeated that somebody caught me at an event and said, are you gonna talk about this? Churchill became totally overwhelmed with the idea, could Stalin take over Europe after Germany falls? And so Churchill's life began um, to worry about that really. Um, and he formed something called Operation Unthinkable and really wanted to, um, with Roosevelt, when well, Roosevelt was dead with Truman, pin uh, Stalin down. And then the ball dropped. The general election came in 1945, just a month after the Allies win. And Churchill tells his doctor, I have a strong feeling my work is done. He wakes up on July 25th 
and finds out he's no longer prime minister. He's been kicked out by his own people after this incredible win. Uh, he, he was humiliated in the, honor, in, the, in the hour of glory. This is just a month after. Can you imagine? Um, someone suggested the electorate was guilty of ingratitude. Churchill, he said, I wouldn't call it that. They, they've had a very hard time. Churchill had a greatness of soul. Despite his concern about Stalin, he returned to Europe. He was 70 years old. He found it hard to cope with his loss of status. His family tried to help him back together. He started painting. His friend Truman tried to help him out. He knew he was in a really, really bad spot. He said, would you come to my hometown uh, around Fulton, Missouri? And would you give a speech? Give us an important speech. The people love to hear you talk. Um, Churchill travels to Fulton and gives a very important speech where he says, we must never cease to proclaim in a fearless tones the great principles of freedom. There is a threat to the safety of the world, and that threat is the Soviet Union. It is my duty to state the facts as I see them to you today. I call for a special relationship between Britain and the United States. The papers laughed at him. They said, who is this old man? How could he be so stupid? The Wall Street Journal was appalled at the suggestion that U.S. might enter cooperation with Britain. Truman felt obliged to try to explain Churchill. He thought he was out there. But the whole thing about it was Churchill was right. Uh, he was right about the whole thing. That was his intuition. Just like before, he could see the communist threat. And before, he, before we knew it, the Soviet Union was moving everything this way to take more territory um, like they did in, in um, Germany. June 5th, 53, he suffers a terrible stroke. Uh, his recipe for getting better, a breakfast of eggs, bacon, sausages, and coffee, followed by a large whiskey soda and a big cigar. Um, he wanted another summit. He loved summits. And at the age of 80, he went to the palace and resigned as, in his second tour as prime minister. Churchill knew instinctively what was wrong with communism. He repressed it literally with state control. His widely criticized speech in Fulton had helped shape the architecture of the post-World War. The transatlantic alliance that in 1948 was to become NATO. He was essential to the foundation of NATO. Also, Churchill was one of the first to articulate the idea of a reconciled France, a united Europe. I won't talk about the common market um, or the Middle East, but I just wanted to tell you this little clip about um, Aristotle Onassis was one of his best friends. He often would be on, the, um, on Onassis's boat. Um, he, and Churchill always wanted to meet JFK. He, he, he had met JFK once, but in his advancing years, he didn't know that uh, it was JFK. But he was on the Christina at the age of 86. He received a phone call from the White House said, Churchill, will you come? It was John, John F. Kennedy. He said, will you come and visit me for a few days? Churchill just couldn't do it. He wasn't mobile enough. This is what the, uh, uh, the Christina looked like. I can remember, don't you all remember those years when Jackie uh, Kennedy married? Uh, that, was like, that was like the, the um, scandal of the, of, of, of the time. So he eventually decided to go home to Britain. He was in advanced age, but of course he took his supplies with him two bottles of cognac, seven bottles of wine, and one bottle of brandy. Uh, later years, he spent at Chartwell, 225,000 people have visited. He's got over 539 paintings. I don't know if you saw this, this is crazy. Angelina Jolie just sold one for $11.5 million. Um, they're pretty cool paintings. What's his impact? Thousands of young Winstons in Britain. Uh, he's been in many movies, nightclubs, Wherever his name is mentioned, it's kind of positive. He believed in merit. Um, and uh, his factor is a greatness of spirit and ego with humor and irony. He was committed to public service, democracy. He had a great heart. One final story about him that I, I think tells you about his heart. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good story. One evening during the war, um, a clerk at the Ministry of Defense was headed home. She spotted something in the gutter and as it turned out, it was top secret papers for an invasion of Anzio, Italy. She took it home, gave it to her son. Her son immediately recognized it was something important. His son, her son rushed it back 
to wherever they were at, the how, um, at where Churchill was working. And these were the official main orders for the Battle of, Nuns of Anzio in 1940. Churchill decided to go forward with the invasion of, it, of, of Italy, but the next day he said to his staff, you know, what happened? How in the world did you screw up? His chief of staff told Churchill about the woman and what she had done. Churchill started to cry. It just made him, it made him tear up the fact that a woman had cared this much that she would get those orders back. So he, he, he said to his staff, she will be a dame commander of the British Empire. Churchill said, make it so. Of course, the king said, oh, I'm not going to do that. But when Churchill finally left office in 1945, the last thing he did was make her a dame commander. Churchill got what he wanted, and he celebrated people. Let's listen to about one more minute of his speech. It will not be by German hands that the structure of your A new order. Built. So back to Crowdhammer, back to the first slide I showed you, back to our discussion about Albert Einstein being the person of the century, or, 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 or was it Winston Churchill? Here's what Crowdhammer says. And by the way, I've got a handout of his entire essay. You'll want to take it with you. It's, it's a remarkable read. This is what Crowdhammer says. If you take away Churchill in 1940, and Britain would have settled with Hitler, or worse, Nazism would have prevailed. Hitler would have achieved mastery over Europe. Civilization would have descended into darkness, the likes of which has never been known. Above all, victory required one man without who the fight would have been lost in the beginning. It required Winston Churchill. Dr. Charles Krauthammer, and that was in the year 2000 that he wrote that. So what do you, what, what do you say? Do you, do you agree? How many of you... Let's let's take a let's take a little poll. How many of you would vote for Albert Einstein? And how many of you for Winston? Well, I must have done okay then tonight. Uh, I agree. Um, any quick questions? We don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Sorry, I've gone on, but I wanted to give you a good look at him. I hope, I hope I've done that, a good rounded look. Anybody have a qu any question or an, a comment about anything about Winston Churchill they want to make? Betty's got the microphone right here. Comments? Yes, right here. Just a second. Once again, Dan, you knocked it out of the park. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you for your uh, research. I knew very little about Churchill before this evening, so 90% of what I know about the man is thanks to your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I was just wondering if you could comment on what it was exactly that set the British people against Winston Churchill in such a short time after his major victory during the war. I just find it an amazing, I, I just find it an amazing story and all I can, all I can figure that in, in my reading is that the war had just shocked everybody. So many, so many people had died. So many people had lost people that they just chose to, to go in another direction. And that's really all I can, um, that's all I can surmise. I think it's just an incredible thing that happened. Um, I hope that's okay. Any other, any other thoughts? Well, um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And next Tuesday night, Betty, we're talking about the Blue View next Tuesday night, right? And thanks for everybody online for joining us. I hope you um, 
enjoy the presentation. Next Tuesday night, we're also going to have a presentation from Barb Horwitz, who's right over here. Would you raise your hand, Barb? I asked her to do a presentation uh, for the class that I think is very important. It'll be in the first part of the session. She's going to be talking about McCarthyism and whether everything that's going on now um, is just like with the cancel culture and everything, what went on back in the 1950s. So Barb will be with us in um, the first part of the class. She gave me a little preview today and it was, it looked great. I think you'll enjoy it. And then next Thursday night, we will have Tom DeWeese. Tom DeWeese, The Wretched Transformation. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a great night.